friends, once again, good morning. Good to be with you. We are in week two of this message series that we're calling Check Your Baggage. And the idea is this. Sometimes during this season of Lent, Christians will give up certain things. But sometimes these are not really the things that Jesus calls us to leave behind. My wife has a Facebook friend, a friend from high school, who's a non-Christian. She observed this on her Facebook, on her Facebook feed. She said, "Sometimes I don't. Or she said, somehow, I don't think Jesus cares if you give up Doritos for Lent." I think she's kind of onto something there. Now, granted, this practice of self-sacrifice in the season of Lent for sure has some merit, especially if giving up something kind of draws you closer to what Jesus did for you. But I guess how much more would we benefit spiritually if we gave up or left behind those things that Jesus calls us to truly leave behind as we follow him? Because as we looked at last week, we end up bringing so much more in our relationship with God. So much more than we actually need to bring. And the truth is, sometimes the things that we bring actually prevent us from going deeper and stronger in our relationship with Him. Last week, specifically, we looked at how often we bring this sense of guilt, this feeling of inadequacy over our past. We bring that to our relationship with God. But we looked last week specifically at how Jesus takes all of that baggage with him to the cross. It's nailed to the cross. And how God so, so doesn't want our past to get in the way of what he wants to do with us and you right now. Today we're going to look at how so many of us carry around this sense of wanting to control our lives, even control those around us. And we'll look at how Jesus invites us to look at life differently. But let's first begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, this morning we trust and believe that as we look at your word this morning, we're not so much hearing my words and my word, but yours. O oh Lord, shape us and mold us continually as your people. Lord, lead us this morning to hear what it is that you want us to hear. And Lord, may your word move us and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Luke chapter 9. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself take up his cross, and follow me. How many of you actually like to go on road trips? In my estimation, and maybe you'll disagree, there's kind of three distinct ways to road trip, three approaches, and I think every one of us falls into one of these three categories. Some of us on the road trip like to be the drivers. And to be honest, I think it's because we like the control. I know because that's where I land. I like to control when we go, how we go, when we stop, and most importantly in traffic, what lane we're going to be in. So you've got the road trip drivers, maybe that's some of you, and then you've got the road trip backseat drivers. They don't necessarily want the pressure of actually doing the driving, but they'll certainly weigh in on where to stop and what lane to be in. I remember when my wife Beth and I were first married, we went up to Wisconsin for a few days and we took her mom with us. I was the driver, like I shared with you. I think I've shared with you before how much I love my mother-in-law. But I remember that whole trip, seeing her in the mirror as I was driving, 
reading with her eyes laser-like focused on the speedometer. You've got the drivers, you've got the backseat drivers, and then you've got those who just like to relax, go along for the ride. These are the folks who, when they're going on the road trip, they bring the blankets, they bring the M&Ms, they bring a book, or an electronic reading device, I guess you'd say now, and they just curl up in the back seat. And the only thing, if anything, you'll hear from them at all is this. Let me know when you get there. So quick survey, which one are you? Remember, you've got the drivers, you've got the backseat drivers, and you've got the ride and relaxers. Who are my drivers? All right. Who are my backseat drivers? Will anyone admit it? All right, good. I like the honesty. Good. And who are my ride and relaxers? You know what's cool to see is, I, you know, a number of couples kind of compliment each other. That's <laughs> neat to see, maybe either by God's design or by choice, I don't know. Now I get to the more serious question. You don't need to raise your hand on this one, but I would like you to honestly reflect on this one. In the road trip of life, how do you roll? You see, how you road trip, to me, is kind of a metaphor for how you and I journey through life. And I guess here's what I mean by that. Sometimes you and I have the illusion that we're actually driving. We, at times, so want control over our lives. We want things to happen on our timelines for people to act in the way that we want them to act. We want things to play out in our lives like we want them to play out. And we end up living with the illusion that we're in control. And if that's not you this morning, maybe this is. Maybe you're acknowledging that God is driving but we like critiquing. Bluntly put, we second guess God. Ever find yourself questioning God? Angry with God? We acknowledge Him as the driver, but from where we're seated, we got some questions about where He's going and what He's doing. Now let me warn you here, the temptation as you kind of hear this challenge is to think about who in your life likes to control or who in your life is second guessing what you're doing. But kind of what we said from the beginning around here was that Lent isn't so much about pointing out the sins in others, but in looking at the baggage you yourself bring to your relationship with God. So the real question this morning is this. How do you and I like to maintain control over our lives? How do you and I at times second guess what's going on? Well, friends, the ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ and through his ultimate death on the cross and resurrection we are invited to live a third way. It's a third and really different way of going through life. Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save him. So these words of Jesus happen pretty early on in Jesus' earthly ministry. He hasn't really been with his disciples for all that long. And for sure, at this point in the ministry of Jesus and in the life of the disciples, they are still really figuring out what it means to be a disciple. 
And we know that because they ask questions of Jesus that reveal this. <coughs> they ask questions of Jesus about what he's doing and what he's not doing. They're still trying to, in a way, exert control over their lives and even Jesus' ministry. Let me give you a few examples. At one point, they are with Jesus when Jesus is with a bunch of children. And, and they start to tell the children, let's just keep the adults only seeing Jesus. Let's keep the kids away from Jesus. They're trying to maintain control of the situation. When Jesus is in front of a, a large crowd, some thousands of people, instead of embracing the teaching, they're wondering, how are we going to feed all these hungry stomachs? They don't trust his providence. They're on a boat one time with Jesus on the sea, and the storm gets choppy. And they awake a sleeping Jesus because they don't trust his control. And frankly, not only are they trying to control the situation around Jesus, they're trying to actually control Jesus himself. Right around the time Jesus says these words in Luke 9, Jesus had just told them, the Son of Man, myself, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. Peter, who's one of Jesus' disciples, pulls him aside and says, not you, Lord. Don't do it. Apparently, we're not the only ones who try to tell God what to do. Apparently, we're not the only ones who are trying to control Jesus and control the situation. So it's in this context. And it's in this context that Jesus shares that message. Follow me. It's to a people who like to control, to a people who like to second guess what God's doing, that Jesus invites us to come and find rest in him. In a way, to live the third way. To leave behind our baggage of wanting to control everything around us, wanting to control every situation. Again, Jesus says, whoever would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To deny self and to take up a cross means basically to give up control. And let me tell you, it feels so good. I know from experience that situations around us can wind us up, can work us up. Situations that you deal with at work five days a week can be consuming. Family drama and conflict can take all of our energy. Life uncertainty, not feeling where, not feeling like you are where you want to be, or wondering what God wants you to be doing, all these can weigh so heavy. And there's such a desire for us to just do something about it, to make people act a certain way, or to fix it. But many times, friends, we can't. I had a really wise person once tell me that there's things in your life that you can control, there's things in your life that you can influence, and there's things in your life that you flat out can't control. And the Lord's message for us this morning is to focus on those things that you truly can control and give the rest up to God. Give him that baggage of wanting to control and make everything happen that you want to happen. To give up the illusion of control and in a way to ride and relax. I shared at the outset of worship this morning that I'm preaching over at the Lutheran home in Arlington Heights. Wednesdays during Lent at 2 o'clock. I'm kind of getting used to the rhythm of worship over there. It's kind of a neat rhythm. There's a gentleman named Ray who serves as kind of the congregation's head usher, 
head elder, head church president's kind of facilitator of worship. He's kind of a retired guy who kind of hangs out in the back and makes sure that everything's going the way it's supposed to be going. And I'm kind of getting to know Ray a little bit because I've worked with him now a few weeks. So I saw Ray when I got to church last Wednesday. I said, Ray, how you doing? Ray wears a suit and tie every day to worship. He looked at me kind of really seriously. He said, Pastor, it's Dollar Butter Burger today at Culver's. <laughs> it's a great, great day. I thought about that for a minute because I kind of had a stressful Wednesday before I got to worship. And I thought, man, what a great way to go through life like that. If Dollar Butter Burger Day at Culver's makes your day, and that kind of made the deeper move to say, that is a man who is at peace with God. Recognizing that that's where the Lord has him right now. He's got this spirit of peace. And, and the thing is, I'm sure in, in, in Ray's life, there's things that he can get worked up about. There's things that he can get kind of fired up about. But instead, he's choosing to focus on the fact that he can get a burger for a dollar and eight cents. What a spirit. Ray knows that he's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That there are so many things in his life that he can't control. And he's going to embrace what God has before him. I'm going to close with this. I want you to take your right hand. I want you to kind of open your palm a little bit. Take a look at the center of your palm. I want you to to picture almost the tiniest pebble you've ever seen, kind of right in the middle of your palm. And I want you to kind of close your hand and make a fist around that, around that little pebble. I think so often we think our problems are so big and so grand and so all-consuming. But in actuality, the message of the scriptures is of a God who has control of your life and your situation. And you, in essence, are like that tiny pebble in the hands of a strong and loving God. We begin worship with Psalm 46 to speak of God as our refuge and strength, friends, rest in that. Stop trying to wrestle control of your life and embrace what Jesus has accomplished for you and what it truly means for your Monday through Saturday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll continue.